everyone, and welcome to another It's Live live show. My name is Rodney Smith, and this is Watch It Played. I know we're a little late, but you know something? The people who are watching this after the fact, they don't need to know that, and we don't need to tell them. Except I just did. Fix that for the next time. Welcome. I'm so glad you're here. I'm excited to be doing a live show. You'll notice there's no crazy telephones, and don't think that means that at some point during this live show, I'm going to bring a telephone up, and there's going to be a call. I know that just saying that makes you think there's going to be one. There isn't. I promise you. I, prom I would never lie to you. I promise you there isn't. This is just going to be you and me, some other things here, uh, and your questions and answers. <laughs> so, and I'm looking forward to this live show. It's been, a, it's been a very full, busy month, and we're trying to do these live shows every two weeks. That's the plan. And it's sort of, it's a plan that's sort of been working incredibly. So the next time that you're going to see another one of these live shows, if all goes well, will be June 10th, again at 7.30 Eastern Time. All right. Uh, oh, I should mention, too, if you're ever unsure, it, did something change with the live show? Or they may be doing it at another time. Uh, did something get delayed? Because sometimes the schedule can change. I want to show you something here that might be helpful to you. Let me just uh, bring this up. So what you should be seeing here, if I've <laughs> done this correctly, is our Watch It Played calendar. This is the one for May, and you'll find it at watchitplayed.tv. And we update this as things change in the schedule. If you saw our previous live show I showed this, there was actually a couple of gaps in here. Well, I plugged those gaps in with another tutorial, and we actually had an ASL video go live here. Uh, tomorrow, the BGG store video is going to go live, and uh, on Friday, we'll have a cult of the news. And look, right here is our live show. That's what's happening right this minute. <laughs> so if you ever want to see any changes or updates to the schedule, watchitplayed.tv will give you the information that you need. So that's pretty great, right? All right, so let's go back over here to my schedule because this is going to keep me on track. Oh, right. I always say this at the beginning of uh, these videos. And I believe Andrea, my daughter, who's uh, very kindly helping out in the comments, has also mentioned this, but I'll repeat it as well. If you want to ask a question during the live show, the best way to do it is in this format. Put the word QUESTION in all caps and then ask your question. That will just help it jump out of the chat because I love that people are talking and conversing, but this will make it a little easier for us to find those questions that we might want to answer a little bit later in the show. So let's actually start with a question. This is one that uh, came, I think, on Twitter. Yes, it was on Twitter. It was from Jackie, uh, one of my favorite people, who said, What is the ugliest thing in your closet and can we watch you destroy it live? <laughs> Jackie likes to put me on the spot with, with uh, these kind of questions. Jackie, I'm going to disappoint you here a little bit, I'm afraid, because uh, pro we probably could find something in my closet to destroy. And I would like to be able to do a little more kind of roving camera work during these live shows, but the, I don't have the technical skills yet to pull it off. So we're going to save that question for later. Wait a second, is this your way of trying to trim out the plaid from my... Uh, my Clothing? Is that, is that what this is really going to be? Because I'll tell you this right now, none of the plaid shirts are getting destroyed. Um, and maybe we shouldn't destroy it. Maybe we'll, we'll give it away or something at the very least. I don't know. I'm sure we can find something in my closet that's worthy of being destroyed. But I do have another question that was asked that I think might be a, a decent replacement. Also will lead to some absurdity. Uh, and it came from Justin Lee who watched the On the Radar. On the Radar is uh, one of the new shows on the channel now hosted by uh, Paula Deming and uh, produced by Chaz Marler and, and with occasional pop-ins from, from myself and uh, Matthew Jude. Justin Lee wanted to know, I watched On the Radar, does milk not come in a bag in PEI? So I live in a, a province in Canada called Prince Edward Island, also abbreviated PEI for those don't, who don't know. And in that video, in that particular video, there was a little segment where I was pouring milk into cereal and I had a cardboard carton. And so Justin was a little curious as to why my milk wasn't in a bag. Now, I know that we have a number of uh, viewers from, uh, from uh, the U.S., from America, and uh, some of you might not realize that, yes, in Canada, in fact, we do get milk in a bag. <laughs> uh, I ran out and bought this. Oh, this is, this is part of the reason why I'm late. Um, I had to make an emergency trip because I thought I, I could talk to you about milk in a bag or I could show you milk in a bag. I don't, is there really no milk in a bag in America? Uh, uh, let me know in the comments. But um, this is something that we don't see as much anymore here in Canada, but we still do have it from time to time. So what is milk in a bag? Well, let me show you. Um, it comes in a big bag like this. It's actually, it's kind of a deception because it's actually multiple bags in a bag. 
So in here, you will find a one liter bag of milk. I am a little terrified doing this around my uh, table here because you know if this milk got all over the table, I would be in trouble. But yeah, these bags are very, um, very secure. You really could literally drop it, and and it wouldn't you know it wouldn't explode. Let's test that theory, but let's not test it on the table. I'm going to drop it from about here. Okay. Did you hear that? Yeah, okay. So I'm not screaming, that means it didn't break, <laughs> all right? So these are sturdy bags, and then normally what you do is you have some kind of proper milk container. I don't have one, unfortunately, because uh, we don't typically get milk in a bag, which is why I didn't have any in the video. But normally you would get a container that is sized just a little bit, a little bit smaller actually than the bag itself. And then the, the bag would go in and just fit in nicely. Of course, it would stick over the top a little bit here. And then you would cut a little, opening here. This really is probably not a good idea. Um, like so. And then you would be able to just, you know, pour out yourself a little little glass of milk, which I can't do. I don't actually have a glass down here. Andrew, if you're listening, find me a glass and bring one to me, please. <laughs> I didn't think of that prop. Um, I'm glad we don't really have the bag of milk thing quite as much. I mean, I think part of the reason why it was invented or why it's been used is because, you know, um, milk sometimes come in plastic jugs. And this was cheaper and, and a little more um, environmentally friendly to have the plastic in these kind of bags. Uh, but it can be a bit of a nuisance. So I think one of my favorite bag of milk stories uh, was my grandmother. My grandmother was on the phone and the milk had run out in the container. When the milk runs out, you take the bag out, right? And you go, you go to the fridge, you grab another one of these and you, and you drop it in. Well, she was on the phone. And she thought, well, you know what I'll do is I'll just, I'll get the, the, the end cut here because it's going to be hard to kind of navigate the, the bag of milk into the, into the thing. So she goes and she cuts it while she's on the phone. I, 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 I'm not going to do that, obviously, but I want you to imagine what happens when you cut a hole into the top of a milk bag while you're squeezing it with your hands. Andrea, thank you so much. You're take a Take a bow, everybody. Thank Andrea, you. so very kind. Your we'll, favorite moderator <laughs> yes. and cup bringer. <laughs> and cup bringer, thank you so much. I'll have to pay her more for that. Okay, and... So then when she snipped it, of course, while squeezing it with her hands, the milk just started to just shoot everywhere. And the, what, then there's nothing else you can do except grip tighter. So it just keeps shooting out and you can just see this milk bag going everywhere. Uh, it was really just a thing of beauty. So um, that is one of the dangers. Uh, it's a little, it requires a little more skill, the milk bag, than your, your traditional milk containers. Wow, we spent a lot of time on bags of milk here in this uh, live episode. So this obviously is not ideal. Normally you would not have to hold onto the bag. You could just tip it because the jug would hold it snug, but I'm gonna, oh my goodness, I cannot, I can't risk this. Let's try. Here we go. Can you see? Yeah, all right, here we go. Pouring ourselves a little, a little milk from the bag. Lovely. Okay, now what do I do with this? Because I don't have a fridge down here. Okay, well, look, I have a little, little sip. Mmm. Great. Just, just great. Okay, so that was our milk moment. Uh, our sponsor for this episode, uh, ADL Skim Milk. There you go. All right. Exciting. All right. So that was uh, Jackie. Sorry I couldn't uh, throw something out from my closet, but Justin Lee, uh, sorry, Justin Yee, I hope you are now satisfied to have seen a bag of milk here on the show. All right. So actually, ADL is not the sponsor of this live show, but we do have a sponsor, and I'm sure they're thrilled that we just did a bag segment. So let's, let's actually talk a little bit about our sponsor here. I'm gonna bring this up and prepare myself to show you. Uh, do I have it here? Yeah, hopefully right now you are seeing uh, Board Game Arena, who is a sponsor of our live show. They help uh, sponsor it here, which is fantastic. And I just wanted to point out to you, they've got a new game they just launched. And this one's actually uh, kind of a particular interest to me because the publisher had reached out to me about potentially doing this game. And I haven't had a chance to learn it yet. It's been, like I said, it's been a very busy month. This is one I'd like to learn. What I found out though, is they actually have, here, let's, let's go into this. Oh, and before we go further, let me just also mention that Board Game Arena, what is it? Uh, it is a website you can go to and you can play many of the traditional board games that you'd play with physical components, but you can play them online. And the nice thing is, again, all the games here are licensed and they're done in partnership with the publishers. So I like to, I like to always say that. And there's a variety of different games you can play here and you can set up games for yourself to play with your friends. Or you can put open invitations for people to come join you if you're looking for someone to play. So Rallyman GT not only allows you to play uh, a racing game multiplayer, but you can actually play, what do they say here? The, the game is available for solo training. That's this area here. So it allows you to sort of learn the basics of the game 
solo here. So if you don't have somebody else to play with, you can actually just sort of play the game yourself and learn how it works that way. And if you go here, you can actually get into the game. They do have a video uh, explanation in English. You can download the rule book and you can see sort of the, uh, the game here as well. So Board Game Arena, it's made, oh look, it made the tracks, got the cars set up here and ready to go. Pretty fantastic. And so along with like the various games you can play on Board Game Arena, there's also forums you can explore if you're trying to set up games or you're having trouble and you need to talk to somebody or you want to uh, report a bug. They have forums for that, which are loading. There we go. So Board Game Arena, I want to thank them again, as always, for helping to sponsor the live show and uh, also for continuing to just sort of keep their platform updated uh, with new things for uh, new people to check out like yourself. So give that, a, give that a check out. If you're having trouble, as like a lot of people are these days, I think, getting their gaming in because you know we can't gather in large groups this might be a way to get a little bit of gaming in on the side all right let's uh, you know what let's take a few of your questions i have some questions as well from board game geek we have a watch it played guild you'll find a link to that in the description of this video and sometimes before well, always before a live show i'll announce that the live show is coming and i'll have a spot there where people can ask questions in advance and i do have a few of those but let's just jump right in with some live questions right now because normally i put those till later in the show and it's just it's just us so let's let's look at some of your questions let's see if i actually have your, your questions here to look at i'm realizing now uh andrea did a wonderful job she has a little shared document for me to check out and guess what i did with that document i closed it so that's great let's see if i can uh, open this up quickly and, and not type in my password. The number of times I have typed in my password on the live show and people have yelled in the comments at me for doing that because I've just lost track of it. <laughs> not gonna do that again. Not this time, not this time. First of all though, let me quickly say before I get to a question, a big thank you to John Stroman. Had no comment or question, but very kindly donated a super chat. So yeah, along with our, our sponsor, you can always uh, donate during the show, which we really appreciate. And uh, there's a little dollar sign there by the uh, comments and you can make a donation that way, you can ask a question that way, we'll definitely make sure to, to get to your questions when you do that. But of course, you don't have to, to support the show to ask a question, you can certainly just ask your question, we'll try to get to those as well. But it, it helps the show and, it, and it, it supports us and we really appreciate that. Also, I'll just mention this quickly, it's now becoming the sponsor moment. Uh, in the description of the video, you also find a link to a few other, few other things that you can pick up. We have a Teespring store, so you can pick up shirts and mugs and things like that. We have um, the Watch It Played Game Shelf poster, you can find that there, what else? Oh, Pod Pledge promos, there's links to that as well if you want to pick up promos from various fundraisers we've done in the past. I think that's it. Yeah, that's it. All right, let's get on, like I promised, to your question. So, Board Pep, Board Pep, you know who Board Pep is. Pep here has asked, have you tried the kids on bikes role-playing game yet? Oh, Pep, I think you're just being cruel to me now. Because <laughs> Pep knows when it comes to role-playing games, I'm always talking about how I'd like to play them and then I never get around to them. Although I, I got close, right? I did play that Labyrinth game. I talked about that in the last episode and that's kind of a role-playing adventure game. I have not tried out Kids on Bikes, but I heard that they've announced a new, like a new thematic version of the game called Kids on Brooms. Is that right? I think so. Where you're playing in like the Harry Potter world. It's not the official IP, but that's kind of the, the world that, that you're playing in. I haven't played this. I've heard good things about it. Another uh, game that sort of has a little bit of that vibe of Kids on Bikes or Stranger Things, Chronicles of Crime, a game that I do enjoy and have played, uh, has an expansion called Red, Redfield High or, I forget what, it, I actually forget what the expansion is. Some of you in the comments right now are, are shouting it in all caps at me for, for forgetting, but uh, there's an expansion that allows you to play basically as kids on bikes, solving crimes in your neighborhood. And I haven't got that one picked up. I want to pick it up. I've got the Noir expansion, and Andrew and I played for her first time playing Chronicles of Crime, and uh, I think she really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed it. The, the problem was I couldn't remember which scenarios I had played already. It would be cool if there was a way in the app to sort of tick off, yes, I've played this, because we had to actually false start a couple of scenarios because I th thought I'd started one I hadn't played, and then when we got going, I'm like, oh no, Andrea, I do remember this particular scenario. <laughs> and so she was very patient with me while we reset a couple of times and finally found one I hadn't played. All right, so Amanda Panda, got a question from you asking, what's your favorite solo game? Ooh, favorite solo game. Well, I have an answer for this. Sometimes people ask my favorite and I just, I, I immediately go into a flop sweat because I cannot think of my favorite something and I always feel uh, like a bit of a dummy that I don't know my favorites of things. But I, I would say, historically speaking, the Lord of the Rings LCG is the game I've played the most solo. So I would have to say, I think that must be my favorite solo game. 
I haven't played that game in a while. It was the second or third game, I think, featured on the Watch It Played channel. And I really enjoyed um, <laughs> playing that one on the channel. And um, it's one I would enjoy playing again right now, frankly. I've still got that one stayed in my collection. I don't often go all in on uh, the collectible card games because I understand with my gaming habits, it's, I'm just not likely to, to stay with it for very long. But that is one that I've, I've kept. And I, I don't continue to buy all the latest expansions, but um, I have a nice little collection for, for when the time comes that I'll be able to break it out again. Another solo game, though, I'd like to try it is Nemo's War. And that one, uh, I keep getting close to it. And then I keep getting busy, so it goes back on the shelf. But I really want to try that one as well. Well, this is a good next question with that in mind. <laughs> Jacob C. asks, how do you stop yourself from impulsively buying more games? Ha, ah, well, um, good question, Jacob. I think it's a question for the ages that a lot of uh, passionate gamers <laughs> sometimes ask themselves. Some don't, though. I mean, some people love buying more and more games, and so they're not worried about stopping, and that's fine, too, if you have the uh, room for it and you have the, the finances to support it. Um, go for it. That's fine. But I um, personally have been trying to not impulsively buy games, and that's partly um, from taking stock of the collection I have and looking at the games on the shelf and saying, am I playing all these games very often? And when the answer comes back to me, no, I go, okay, well then, Rod, let's pump the brakes a little bit. Uh, I'm still very much a cult of the new gamer. I love new games. I love cracking open a game. I love discovering its mysteries, figuring out how it works, playing it for that first time. And uh, some games will hit the table over and over again, like Chronicles of Crime. We played uh, another one from Lucky Duck Games, Paranormal uh, Detectives, the other day as well. Um, I, I like going back to old games, but I recognize because of the line of work that I'm in, it's not going to be easy for me to go back and revisit those old favorites. And the reality is, believe it or not, this is not a made-up number, 3,000 new games release a year. So when you kind of take that in mind, I know that there's going to be at least, a, at least 100 games a year that I'm going to have some interest in. Probably 50 that I'm going to be really interested in. And like 25 that I'm going to be super crazy going out of my mind interested in. And it's not easy to play like 100 new games a year for me. So um, just practically speaking, I try to limit myself. I don't back too many Kickstarters anymore. I tend to wait until retail and then I'll pick it up then if I still have the interest. Because guess what? Next year, 3,000 new games are releasing. But that's not to rain on anyone's parade. Like I said, if that's your thing and you love having a growing collection, that's, that's good too. All right. Coralou would like to know, have you been able to get out with your kayak the last few months? Well, I'll tell you this much. It's, there's certainly been good enough weather for it. Things have finally turned. The snow is gone, and it is certainly kayak weather. Uh, some people who maybe have watched my vlog on my other YouTube channel, uh, Rodney J. Smith, well, notice I haven't put a video up there for a while. We'll talk about that in a moment. But no, I haven't been out in the kayak. And uh, I have been out getting a run in, so that's a little bit of physical activity, but I, I do look forward to getting on the kayak. And the first time I do, you can be sure I'll be tweeting about that over on my Rodney J. Smith Twitter account, if you'd like to follow me there, where you can see some of my more personal antics. Uh, I probably will share some video later of the antics involved with um, acquiring this bag of milk tonight, because there, <laughs> there was a little bit of fun with that. I'll probably post that up on the Twitter account later. But no, I haven't been, and I hope to, hope to get out to the uh, kayak. I also hope to put out some new vlogs. I, don't, I know it probably seems like, man, he's never going to get back to that, because it's been a long time since the last one. Uh, there are some good reasons for that, but I will be returning to it, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that at that time. All right, Dylan uh, Kerpal has a question. What's your favorite game to play as a family right now? Ooh, I think I have a pretty good answer for that one, too. Um, the Crew. Uh, Andrea uh, just came home from university. She's still taking some university classes. But before she arrived, uh, Luke and Christy and I had been playing The Crew, and now Andrea's joined us and played that as well. It's a really clever, cooperative, trick-taking game, and I'm sure people have probably heard about this. If you're watching this channel, you're probably a little bit into board games, uh, and, and this game has been making a, a lot of buzz. But maybe you're very new to the hobby, if so, okay, The Crew. Uh, it's a trick-taking game where everyone, like I said, is working together. And so uh, it's scenario-based. So you'll beat a scenario, and then, then you'll be presented with a new scenario with a new challenge. And oftentimes, it's, it's about cleverly working together to make sure you don't take the wrong tricks and you help somebody else get the tricks that they need. If you're familiar with trick-taking games, that might make some sense. If you're not, well, I'm not sure that I want to try to explain the nature of trick-taking games right now, but I, I would say that's the answer to your question. Uh, the Crew is probably our, our favorite game to play as a family, although, um, what's another one? 
Well, like he said, a Chronicles of Crime, some of these mystery solving games, Sherlock, the Sherlock Files, we, me and Andrea and Luke have played through a few of those. Uh, I enjoy the, uh, the, the puzzle unlock style games and exit games. And uh, I have another new one sitting up on the table for the next time I get a free moment and then we can get the family together to try. So, you know what, I'm going to, um, now that I've answered a few viewer questions, don't worry, I see that there are more and we're going to get to more of them. I'm going to try to get through all the questions that come through on this live show. I don't always accomplish that. I'm going to try that tonight. But I actually want to take a little break because you might have noticed the thumbnail was called Bags and Bikes. I actually changed the thumbnail like multiple times today. <laughs> One time it was bicycles, then bikes, and now bags and bikes. So what am I talking about with bikes? Well, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you right now. Bikes is a little shorthand term for bicycle. Um, that's not a surprise to you, but bicycle cards specifically is, uh, are sometimes referred to as bikes. And I, um, I have some bicycle decks of cards. I have uh, some red ones, I have some blue ones, I have some more red ones, I have some more red ones, some more blue ones. I have um, empty uh, boxes. I'm collecting empty boxes now, apparently. I've got uh, red ones, more red ones and shrink, and more red ones and more and more, and I've got uh, many more than this uh, upstairs. I started to dab a little bit in magic and I went a little, I got a little crazy about decks of cards. You do kind of need to have decks of cards on hand. I have many. Um, and now I have many more. And actually, I got contacted by Bicycle. Uh, they, <laughs> they wanted to send me some product to potentially show on the channel. And uh, I'll be honest, I selfishly said yes. Because apparently, this was not enough um, for me. And so I greedily asked for more. So <laughs> they're not sponsoring anything here, but they did send these to me. And I feel like I should take a couple of moments and show you not just the decks, but also uh, a little app that they have. Let me move a couple things out of the way here and see if I can do a slightly better display. All right, there we go. Here's some, here's some high school cards. Look, the thing is, there's some really clever and cool, unique designs that they have. And I, I have a couple of friends who collect unique, unique decks of cards. And I have to be honest, I kind of looked at them and thought, that's a weird thing to do. Uh, which is, you know, a, a ridiculous reaction to have when you look at my shelf of games. But anyway, um, we all have things that we don't quite understand, right? And, and collecting decks of cards was one of those things for me. Wait a second, there we go. That's, now, it's, now it's upright to you and me. Um, so yeah, so <laughs> let's, let's take a look at these. Um, so some of these I actually already had and some they sent to me. This is one they sent to me. I'm kind of curious with a Stargazer Sunspot. And uh, while I'm talking to you about these, I actually want to mention they have... An app. Let's see, do I have that handy here? Yeah, I do have the app here. I want to show you this. This was kind of cool. This was one of the things that they hoped that I would, would show you. So I thought, as, as for being so nice to send me um, the decks of cards, I will show you this. There's all kinds. There's bazillions of cards you can play with a regular deck of cards. And I think sometimes as board gamers, we might not value some of these games quite so much because they're, they're I don't know, they're like old traditional games and we have all these fancy new games on the shelf. But there are loads of great, interesting, challenging games you can play with a regular deck of cards. And what I liked about this app is there's just, there's loads of them. Now they have some here that they feature, you know, and you'll, you'll see some basic ones like Crazy Eights, they, uh, Texas Hold'em and so forth. But then you can go into like regional and you can see ones like, here's a game from the Northeast, Crazy Eights. Or you can go into Discover and just see like <laughs> alphabetically just loads and loads of games. And if you see something that you like, you can, you can flag it like Spider Solitaire, give it a heart, and then it will show up here in your uh, favorites list. Um, and so I, I actually have favorited a couple that I was just reading. I laid in bed, I was reading the rules to some of these, and I thought, this sounds like something I would enjoy playing. Um, I'm going to try to do that, especially since I have... You know, all these decks of cards, I should probably do something with them besides just store them on a shelf. And the other nice thing about the, uh, the games list here is you can filter them. You can go, okay, I want to filter by age or by number of uh, players or even by, by types. Like, here's trick-taking games if you want to learn something about trick-taking games. So when you go into one of these, um, one of these uh, games, it then gives you how to play. And uh, again, you know, I'm a little fussy about uh, rules, right? I, I was pretty impressed. The tutorials that I was reading were pretty well written. I didn't really have any questions when I was done. All right, let's take a look though at a couple of these, these cool, uh, cool decks of cards. So yeah, what we're going to look at, right, this one here. This is the uh, Stargazer. Let's see what makes this such a cool deck aside from the, uh, the nice packaging. All right, so here, actually they, right here, they, they tell you how to find their app and, and discover things for it, which is kind of neat. Uh, all right, so, well, first of all, they have a kind of a cool Stargazer-y back, but I'm guessing, yeah, yeah, not surprisingly, 
they've got kind of, kind of some interesting fronts here as well. Oh, that's neat. Look at that. It's kind of like almost like a negative image, but uh, in a very glowy way. Let's see what their aces look like. Sometimes they do fancy designs on the aces. There you go. That's pretty nice. So there's, a, there's an example of one of these decks. That's probably one I'll want to break it and play. Foil back crimson. Sure, we want some foil back crimson. What does that mean? I'm guessing it means we're going to see a lot of decks that look like this on the back. Let's, uh, let's find out. The other thing I like about bicycle cards, the reason why I keep buying them, is they're relatively inexpensive, unless you're getting some of these fancier ones, and um, they're good quality. So whether you're playing games or you're trying to do a little cardistry or you're doing magic tricks, um, they hold up to some wear and tear. So this is, this is basically like a regular deck of playing cards. The, the, um, the kings and queens and jacks have a slightly different uh, pattern and coloring, but sure enough, yeah, on the back here you can see a little bit of a foil, which actually might be kind of cool in a magic trick, actually, because if I was doing a magic trick with like a red deck and uh, I wanted to reveal like a special card in the deck, you know, having a foil back to pop out, that could be, uh, that could be kind of fun. All right, so that's, uh, that's that deck. Let me just look at uh, one more, and then we'll get back to your questions, because some of you are <laughs> likely are not as fascinated with uh, decks of cards as I am. Let's see what else they got here. But I mean, it's incredible. Um, the Bicycle or the, uh, the U.S. Playing Card Company, the types of things they can make with decks, like even hole punches and different things, it's pretty incredible. Uh, when I was at the BGG retreat, um, Board Game Geek is, is actually near to one of their uh, manufacturing plants. And they were able to see all kinds of unique, not just foils and different designs, but actually functionally very unique imprints and things on the cards themselves. Here, I'm a little off center. Uh, so which one's this? So this one was the Aurora playing cards. Again, kind of a cool pattern on the back, which is kind of nice. And even the, yeah, even the, uh, the face cards are pretty distinct here as well. I can kind of see why people collect playing cards. It is kind of cool. This is one I just saw, like I was just going through a Walmart and I saw that pattern, I thought that's kind of cool, so I bought that. You asked uh, earlier, I was asked the question of, you know, how do I stop compulsively buying board games? And I talked about how, you know, how I exercise great restraint. Uh, ask me how I stop from compulsively buying uh, decks of cards. Maybe that's a question that should be <laughs> asked soon. Uh, I, I, probably, I probably have enough for a little while. Okay, so that's... Uh, those are some playing cards. We've made a nice little mess there. Let's uh, actually, I have a couple of questions that came in on the BGG Guild. So I'm going to answer a couple of those and then I'm going to get back to some of your live questions as well. Okay. Oh, that's, <laughs> that's the question we already answered from... Who was it? Oh, gosh, I'm just clicking all the wrong things from Justin. Yeah, okay. So this one here. Oh, coffee, tea, soda, what kinds? This is from Andrew, who I've dubbed Mr. Playlist because Andrew has created an incredible geek list for Watch It Played. He has categorized every game and uh, video that we've done and created this incredible geek list. You, you have to check it out. You'll find the link in the description below. Click on it. It's, it's, um, it's so comprehensive. He's pulled out like all of the non-game things that I've created. I even have hidden videos on the channel that he has links to if you want to go see them and little descriptions by them. Uh, he's organized the gameplays with the uh, tutorial videos. It's really uh, an incredible job. I've done a number of things over the years trying to organize that. In fact, actually, Pep, who asked a question earlier, and maybe still in the chat, uh, chat he made an incredible catalog, uh, Excel sh spreadsheet, of uh, many of the games in the collection. We were just trying to be able to organize and find links to things. Sometimes, like YouTube doesn't have tremendous tools sometimes when you're trying to organize what you've done, what you've created. So, um, yeah, really, really nice uh, to have Andrew's help here. So he wants to know, coffee, tea, soda, what kinds? I'm not a coffee drinker. I will drink it socially. If people are out having a coffee, sure, I'll have a coffee to fit in, I guess. But I, I'm not really a big coffee drinker. If I have coffee, I'll have it black. Tea, I, I more prefer tea. I like lemon teas, but I like black teas as well. I think my favorite tea was Yorkshire tea, which I had when I was in the UK. It was actually, yeah, it was fantastic. I was told it would be, and it was. A soda? Uh, my favorite sodas, my favorite soda is Canada Dry. I know, very on brand for me, but it is. It's my favorite soda. And uh, I, I, that's pretty much what I'll get. Uh, it's, I try to go with clear sodas if I'm going to have it. I try not to have a lot of soda because it's all the sugar, but uh, if I do grab some, that's what I tend to have. And um, this is another favorite of mine, Peace Teas. I like Peace Teas. This one here is the uh, tea and lemonade. Um, yeah, so there's, there you go, Andrew. <laughs> I figured you deserved an answer to that question. And I deserve to drink. Sometimes people ask me what I'm drinking here on a live show, and I don't answer. Sometimes 
it's because of what it is. And YouTube will uh, demonetize you for talking about certain subjects, and so I just don't want to be demonetized, so I don't uh, talk about it. So don't feel like I'm ignoring you or purposely don't want to tell you. I'm just uh, trying to be a little prudent there. All right, so Coralie L had an interesting question. Do you have any cool gamer names? For example, Captain Rodney Barry for Star Trek games. Coralie also asked, like, does, does uh, Chaz go by the pun sure because he loves puns so much? Another good uh, potential moniker for Pep, for that matter. Pep is like the king of puns as well. Um, no <laughs> is the short answer. <laughs> I don't think I've ever been dubbed with a name when I'm playing a game. I do have internet handles that I use from time to time. Uh, Papa J was uh, a really bad rapper name I gave myself when I was younger and liked to pretend I could do some rapping. Uh, let's see, Pelvidar was my like sort of main internet handle for a long time, and it was actually my handle on Board Game Geek as well for a long time. Pelvidar. Pelvidar because that was the name of a character that I wrote in a book I was writing. When I was young, I would like to uh, give myself projects to do, but I was never good at giving myself small projects. I would not write a short story. I would write an epic five-page, you know, series. I would read Lord of the Rings and I'd go, I want to write a story like that. And that's how I would start, writing a story like that. Of course, I would only get two or three chapters in before it, it all ended. But in one of those stories, uh, yeah, there was a character named Pelvidar. And it was a great internet handle because I knew it was something I'd made up so no one else would ever try to use it. I would never have to stick a bunch of numbers at the end of my name. Okay, that's, uh, that's hopefully an answer to your question. Not quite the answer to your question, Coralie, but, you know, in the spirit of your question, I think. Todd Adair wanted to know, how fast did I back Kemet? So Kemet, as I have said in the past, is, uh, was one of my favorite games, was my favorite game for a long time. Uh, it hasn't fallen out of favor with me, but as I've said a couple of times, I think on the live shows, I haven't played it in a long while, like two years now. So I feel a little bit self-conscious about saying it's my favorite game when I haven't pulled it off the shelf. Maybe if I played it today, I'd be like, well, you know, it doesn't feel the same to me as it used to or whatever. Maybe my tastes have changed. Because that happens, right? I remember there was a time I had no interest in Euros whatsoever. Give me Mansions of Madness every day of the week, that kind of game. And I still love my Mansions of Madness style games, but I also love Euros. So tastes change, right? Uh, but I suspect I would still like Kemet because uh, it's just, uh, as I think of it now and the mechanisms of that game, I, I always really like that one. The, uh, the new Kickstarter, yeah, it is it has launched. It's a new edition, and um, I haven't backed it yet. Is that surprising? I don't know. I guess in part, again, you know, I was asked earlier, how do you keep yourself from impulsively buying games? Well, I have base Kemet, which I would say I think I still love, and I haven't played that for a while, so I don't see the need to run out and buy another version of it. I think if I was somebody who was more likely to be playing it uh, more regularly, I would definitely consider it. Um, that's not trying to discourage anyone from backing the Kickstarter, of course. Although I did have kind of a follow-up question here uh, from Ben H. asking, I cut out part of his question because it was also asking about Kemet, but this was the follow-up second part of the question. How do you feel about buying newer editions of games you already love? Which Kemet would fall into that category. I don't have any qualms about it. I like buying new editions. I'm always kind of thrilled when a new edition is announced for a game that I know I already like because it generally takes the guesswork out of the purchase, right? Because I know, oh, this is a game I like. And usually a new ed edition, generally, the idea is it has some improvements, right? They've streamlined maybe some rules that were a little clunky. They've got rid of some things that were questionable that people didn't like. Maybe they've upgraded the components and made them a little sexier or cool, whatever. So, um... Yeah, I'm, I'm all for it. I don't, I don't see it. Like sometimes, I, look, sometimes people go, look, if you're going to release a new edition, you better release an upgrade pack that I can buy so I don't have to buy your new edition because I already bought your first edition. I think it's nice if publishers do that, but I don't feel like they should feel they have to. Um, things change. As, I, look, if you just released a game one year and the next year you've released a new edition, okay, maybe in that case. But Kevin's been around for a long time. It's probably due for a little bit of a refresh. So I'll be keeping an eye on the, on the Kickstarter page, and who knows, my, uh, my, my backing finger might get itchy and I might, I might back it yet. But for now, uh, I, haven't, I haven't pulled the trigger yet. I haven't pulled the trigger yet. Okay, look, let's, why don't we jump into some more uh, of your questions? Why don't we? Because I know that there's some of them piling up here. I'm just going to scroll down. Oh, yeah, there's a, there's a few here. Okay, so I'm going to do my best to, um, to jump through some of these. Cameron Art asks, loving the new shows. Well, thank you, Cameron. That's very nice of you to say. Has the pandemic affected your day-to-day -day life? 
much in such a small town. Um, well, first of all, for people who don't know, or I suppose if you were here at the beginning of the show, you saw the, the calendar showing, like the, the schedule of videos releasing on the channel. We have introduced a bunch of new shows to the channel, uh, courtesy of a collaboration between myself and Chaz Marler and Matthew Jude and Paula Deming. And I'm really excited, really, to have um, them to work with. And, and I'm really, if I can be, uh, I'll just say it. I'm proud. I'm really, not for myself, uh, the work that they've been doing. It's, I don't think it's an easy thing to come into an already established channel and be doing something quite radically different than has already been presented by that channel. Uh, and I'm actually not just proud of them, but I am proud of them because I think it takes a certain amount of bravery to do that and to be willing to do that. Um, but I'm also really proud of our viewers, frankly, <laughs> because it's also a change for many of you. And it's been really heartwarming to see so many encouraging, positive comments, people enjoying the videos, giving them a chance. Now, not everyone, not everyone's enjoying it, of course, but even many of the people who haven't have been very kind and respectful. And again, I just appreciate that they gave it a shot. But it's been really nice to see, um, uh, YouTube has a nice feature now when someone leaves a comment if their privacy settings are a certain way, you can see if they're a subscriber or not to the channel and how long they've been a su subscriber. And one of the, yeah, again, the most heartwarming things has been to see the positive comments and then realize it's from someone who's a subscriber and then realize it's someone who's been a subscriber for like seven, eight years. And, and to see them um, encouraging the continued evolution of the channel. So um, I really appreciate that. I, I want to thank people for the, for the kind words of support and, and, again, for checking out the videos. We'll have a, an, another, again, one of the new shows is the Cult of the News, a show, again, that I'm also really proud of that, that Matthew's been doing, and that'll be airing on uh, Friday. I hope you'll, uh, you'll tune in and check that out. But there was another part of the question, Cameron. Oh, yes, how has it changed the day-to-day -day life of, of things here? Uh, I'll try to keep this quick. Uh, PEI, we're fortunate. We're kind of an isolated area, and, and uh, steps were taken very quickly to address dealing with COVID-19. Uh, social distancing was enforced. The borders were closed down, not entirely, but like things were monitored, people coming across the border and, and things like that. So fortunately, the cases that we did have have all been satisfactorily and successfully kind of resolved. And currently on the island, there are no cases. So things are starting to open up a little bit here, but they're keeping a close eye on, on seeing how things go. I, I also, I'll just say, I've been very fortunate that um, because I always did my work in isolation, I've been able to keep doing that work. And uh, I know that's not true for everybody, and uh, I feel fortunate that I've been able to keep doing this. And thank you for joining me here um, in this live show. It's, it's something else that we can kind of do that's sort of a social event. I like to try to make it as social as possible, so that you, you know that you actually are a part of this, this show, but it's something we can do and, and still maintain that social distancing. All right, Stephen Hanbury asks, do you recommend Charterstone or Pandemic Legacy as a first legacy game? Oh, that's a tough one. That is a tough one. I say it's tough because it's not an easy answer. I mean, you know, I, I always struggle with recommending and reviewing games. I try to, to loosen up a little bit here in the live shows. I, <laughs> but both of these games, I think, are good first legacy games. Because... Um, Pandemic, here's what, I, here's what I'll say about Pandemic. Pandemic Legacy, one of the things that's great is that if you already know Pandemic, then you don't have any additional rules overhead to learn as you play. So that's great. I mean, you're going to be learning some new rules, and you shouldn't take it for granted that, oh, I've already played Pandemic, so I can just start playing Pandemic Legacy. You definitely want to check the rule book because there are some very important differences, but the bulk of those rules will be familiar to you. And the thing about Legacy games is they keep changing, right, game by game by game. Uh, in many cases. So it means, again, the changes are minor and most of the rules you already know. Charterstone will be more fresh from the beginning. Um, I think that the way the rules are presented in the Charterstone rulebook, it's not, I, I think it's not necessarily as intuitive to learn, but I, if I may be so bold, I do have a tutorial video for it, which I think will make anything that's confusing in the, the rules learning method that they used in that game, it'll clear it all up. So you should be able to have, have no trouble getting off uh, to a good start in your first game. And then the way rules add on afterwards are very gradual. So I think it's a very friendly and inviting kind of style of game, the look of it and everything. And uh, the Seer Cabal Gaming Podcast, one of my favorite board gaming podcasts, they just did a review of Charterstone in their most recent episode. And I, they did a review of the digital version of, of it. And I, I have to be honest with you, I wasn't sure if I would enjoy hearing a full review, the kind of like in-depth review they do for a digital version of a game. But it was fantastic. 
Um, and uh, I think it's worth checking out. So that might be a great way to get some more information about that game. But I'm sure you've heard Pandemic Legacy Season 1 has been a very popular and praised legacy game, and I think there's good reason for that. And my family did play through that. Actually, we played through both Pandemic Legacy and Charterstone. Manda Panda. What did you play during BGG Online Con? Online BGG Conline, I think is, they, <laughs> is what they call it. BGG Conline. Uh, what did I play? Well, they haven't, had, they haven't held the BGG Con where it's very gaming focused. That's one that they're doing in collaboration with the Dice Tower, as I understand it. And uh, that one hasn't been held yet. But when they hold that one, they will have all kinds of virtual games that you can sign up for and join and play. And I, I might, if I get a chance, jump in and, and play some of those. If that's the one going on in June, though, that might be tricky. My June is, uh, it's, it's not going to be easy to do additional uh, other projects, but um, July, July will open up again. I think there's going to be another BGG Conline in July, and I might have a chance to be more of a part of that. Coralou, this is very appropriate. You asked, will you be joining in on the BGG Dice Tower Virtual Con in June? Uh, so, yeah, to answer your question, I don't think I'll be too much involved. Unfortunately, I had several things already planned for June, and then this is something that sort of got uh, planned later. So I was, my time was already pretty filled up. So um, I'd like to be involved. I like the idea of it, but I don't know that it's practical to say that I'll be involved. Better I say I won't be and then maybe surprise pop in for something. <laughs> All right. Shorty Dancer would like me to describe my perfect sandwich. Okay, well, um, my fav oh, my, one of my favorite types of sandwiches is a club sandwich, but it's not the kind I typically make for myself because a club sandwich is a lot of work. <laughs> and I have a funny relationship with food. You know, there's people who are real foodies. I think of my pal, uh, Marty Cannell, uh, from Only Dice and Taking Names. When we go to a convention, he, he spends most of his time talking about where we're going to eat next. He is always thinking about the restaurants and the food they're gonna, we're going to eat and all the rest of it. And for me, food is more like a, a speed bump in my day. It's some, I'm, in the, I'm trying to do things, trying to get things done, and eventually you, you have to eat or you collapse on the floor. And so I just go to the cupboard and I try to grab the quickest thing I can possible, shove it in my face. Food to me, for the most part, is just f fuel um, <laughs> to keep me going. The only time that's really changed actually is when I've been with, um, sometimes at conventions we'll go to a very nice restaurant and yeah there has been a few times at a very nice restaurant where I've had that experience of eating a meal where I've been kind of like just wow this is incredible <laughs> I'm experiencing a moment here. Um, the Bob's Steakhouse in, uh, in Dallas, incredible. I mean the best meal of my life uh, I had there with BGG. Um, Scott Alden from, from Board Game Geek very kindly took out the, the BGG team there, and, and I was there as well, and it was just like, wow, uh, an incredible meal. All right, uh, but you were asking about my favorite sandwich to make. I'm assuming it's my favorite sandwich to make, let's say that, because club would be my favorite one if someone else was making it for me. So when I make it myself, usually I find sandwich meat, I find cheese, barbecue sauce, toss it between uh, two pieces of meat, throw it into the microwave so it melts the cheese and softens up the bread, and that's kind of my... Uh, boring favorite me uh, sandwich. But again, remember, for me, food's just fuel for the most part. More games, please, asks favorite childhood memory. Uh, I'm assuming this is Ross, maybe? More games, please? I hope so. If it is, I shouldn't say I hope so, because if it isn't Ross, it's not that I'm disappointed that some other person with the name More Games, Please is here. I'm also glad you're here. But if this is Ross, hi, Ross. <laughs> favorite childhood memory. Ooh, that's the kind of question, you know, that's, that's fun to get uh, in advance so you can think of a good answer. Favorite childhood memory. You know what, I'll make it kind of gaming related. Uh, I think, I don't know if I did talk about this before. I might have. I might have talked about this before on the live show because I think I might have shown some photos from my childhood with my grandfather. Um, he's the one who taught me how to play checkers and Chinese checkers and a few other traditional games like that and um, I, I used to love visiting him. He lived about four, five hour drive away. We would drive to visit my grandparents and I would love when he would invite me in and we wouldn't sit at the table. He would sit in his big soft chair uh, covered in blankets and he would sit there and he would lean over and he would get the, the footstool that he would normally put his feet on, this little round footstool. He would then set the, the game we were going to play there. And I would sit on the floor on the opposite side of him. 
and uh, he would teach me how to play, and then we would play over and over again. He'd, he'd beat me, and I'd ask to play again. He'd beat me again, I asked to play again. He'd beat me. He never let me win, uh, at least as far as I know. I feel confident in that because he beat me to the point of frustration for me. And he would have seen that, and obviously that didn't make him cave uh, or take pity on me. And I'm glad for that. Uh, not a judgment call on those people who let their kids win from time to time, but I, I was glad for it because uh, when I did win, I really felt I'd accomplished something. And uh, it made me feel pretty good. Uh, those were, yeah, those were um, good. Ha! <laughs> ah! <laughs> uh, that's um, hmm. giving me some feelings. Uh, yeah, I had, a, I had a good, uh, funny thing too, actually, my grandfather, he, he, uh, he was a really easy crier. He, he felt things very deeply, and it wasn't unusual for him to share a thought or a memory and himself get a little teary-eyed from it. Really soft, gentle man. You know, he loved nature, very quiet, soft-spoken. I remember one time, gosh, what was it? Oh, yeah, um, he had this, this stone wall in, out in the garden. They grew vegetables and things. And I, I loved hanging out at my grandparents' place. I'd go out and play by myself, and, and I'd craft these imaginative stories, and I'd be a pirate or whatever. And I think I was a pirate on a ship in, in this particular story, I remember. And I'm, I'm standing on this, this rock wall, and I was, I was taking rocks off the wall and then throwing them into the field. I was throwing, you know, blasting the cannons or whatever, which effectively is the same thing as destroying your grandfather's rock wall in the garden. And uh, he came out, and he was not happy. And it was all the more shocking because, again, he was such a soft, gentle, loving soul. And he, he yelled at me, and uh, I was devastated. I was devastated, bawling my eyes out. Like, I just, I didn't know what to do with myself. My, my grandfather disappointed in me. And um, <laughs> I remember that was one of those times. After he'd yelled at me, and I had apologized and said I was sorry, um, you know, to make it up, to me and let me know things were okay. He invited me to play a, a game of checkers, and then soundly thumped me. But um, that's when I knew things were things were okay. Uh, Amanda Panda, favorite game you've played with Board Pep? Well, we've had some good games together, uh, <laughs> Pep and I. I think some of my favorite games though have been the party games. Uh, I'm thinking of Snake Oil. Gosh, I loved playing Snake Oil with Pep because um, he's also a very creative, inventive mind, and. Uh, so coming up with like arguments for why of this particular weird item that you're trying to sell is a good item. That was fun. Uh, he loves werewolf. Um, I don't love werewolf quite as much as he does, but if you're in a game of werewolf with him, I think you're going to enjoy yourself quite a bit. Uh, what else? What other party games? Oh, um, Telestrations. Playing Telestrations with Pep is also a good time. <laughs> but many, also many other Think Your games as well. He is, um, he's just an incredible gamer. Pep has a great mind for games, and one of the things that I, uh, I think he's particularly good at, I don't know if this is true or not, this is my perception, uh, Pep may feel differently, I don't know, but he's so good at looking at a board state and understanding the value of things. I, I'm always, I feel like doing it by feel, and uh, feelings are not always <laughs> accurate when you're dealing with hard math, <laughs> but he's very good, I think, at looking at a board state and going, these troops here are more valuable than those troops there. If I'm going to protect something, I need to protect those and not worry about those. So then when he's negotiating with you, you know, he, you might feel like he's giving you everything you, you could ever want and ask for, but he knows those things are not worth anything anyway. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, just a really sharp, quick mind that way. Um, which also, unfortunately, and I've talked about this before, actually, when, when we do, sometimes do live shows together, kind of, uh, I think, a, a burden for him, too, because, because he's so good at games, we'll often win. People will target him in games even to the point where they're hurting themselves. Like, Pep's not actually a threat, but he has to now deal with everyone thinking that he's the big threat at the table, even when he's not, um, which I have to imagine sometimes would be a little, <laughs> little frustrating. Brian Horn asks, perfect meal before a game night of gaming. Also, I cannot believe it's 9.30 right now. Uh, 9.30 my time. Uh, I, I, I wanted to keep this to about an hour, and I wanted to try to get through all your questions. Where'd the time go? I know we started late, so we'll keep going a little bit further. Perfect meal before a long night of gaming. Well, Brian, I have, I'm going to disappoint you here. I'm going to keep this one short in the interest of time. Because, um, I, I, okay, you know what, I'll, I'll, I'm going to answer. I was going to say, again, I, I'm not much of a foodie, so I don't, I don't much care most of the time. I love lasagna, though. Uh, I love uh, my mother-in-law's lasagna, one of my favorite meals. Um, so I would, I would pick that if I could have that <laughs> before a game night. Uh, I probably wouldn't want to eat lasagna necessarily at a game night. A little, a little bit of a messier uh, meal. 
I want to say, Tones My Bones, thank you very much for such an awesome handle and for your very kind and generous super chat. <laughs> That's, I love Tones My Bones. I like rhymes too, by the way. You know, some people like puns. I like rhymes. Uh, so Tones My Bones, thank you so much for the super chat during this, this live show. It's very encouraging and I appreciate that. And that will, uh, that'll go to something good and important and it won't be just another bag of milk. <laughs> I promise you that. All right, so... Ephraim Owen Mazza asks, what is your favorite movie of all time? I'll also try to keep this one quick. Uh, it's a little rabbit hole I could fall down if I wasn't, wasn't careful. I do have a number of favorite movies for different reasons. Uh, I would say that Brazil was one of my favorite movies of all time. Uh, what other ones would I want to offer up? I'll just mention another one. Uh, 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 the Twelve Monkeys is another one. I like time travel movies. Primer would probably be... I'd have to say Primer as well. If you haven't seen Primer and you don't mind a low-budget, thinky movie, I would say Primer. So Primer and... Uh, yeah, Primer and Brazil. Let's, let's say those two. Coralula asks, what is your favorite kind of question to ask? What, answer. <laughs> what's, your favorite, what's, your favorite kind of question, what's your favorite kind of question to ask? That would be an interesting question in, in and of itself. So what is my favorite kind of question to answer was Coralou's actual question. I'm not fussy. Um, I do like when a question catches me off guard. I don't mind when a question inspires me to go like, you know what, I have to leave the table and go grab a, a prop to, to, to answer the question. Sometimes that throws me a panic, but it's also kind of fun to do. Um, but I don't mind the, the questions that I might get asked uh, on more than one occasion. Some of the old favorites, that's fine, because for some people it might be the first time hearing the answer, and it's always nice that people uh, take an interest. Um, <laughs> so questions like, that's the first time, Corlew, I've ever been asked that. So there you go. That's one of my favorite types of questions. The new ones are kind of fun. Miles T asks, you mentioned Keyforge before. Have you ever played Yu-Gi-Oh, Pokemon, TCG, or Hearthstone? Uh, I have not played Yu-Gi-Oh. I have played Pokemon TCG. used to play that with my kids a bit. And I have played Hearthstone. Hearthstone. I would say of those, Keystone, Keystone. <sighs> Keyforge, my favorite. Then Hearthstone. Then Pokemon. And then Yu-Gi-Oh! has to lose by default because I, I haven't played it. <laughs> but I really liked Hearthstone. And I played it a bunch. Uh, but eventually just stopped, you know, time constraints mainly, and, and feeling like I wasn't keeping up. I, the problem with collectible games is that I, I can have a little bit of a collective nature. That's part of the reason why I like Keyforge, because I never felt the compulsion that I had to buy it all because it's impossible. You can't. Every deck is unique. <laughs> so, so that kind of suits me well. And I also really liked the mechanics of Keyforge, like the game itself. I loved it. If it didn't have the, even the, let's call it gimmick, um, of all unique decks every time you buy a deck, the mechanics of that game I found really fascinating and satisfying. Ephraim Owen Maza asks, what is the heaviest game you've created a how-to-play video for? I think, I think I've said this one before, is Stronghold 2nd Edition. It may not be the heaviest game, but it had the most rules ambiguities tied in with the fact that it was a complicated game, and that certainly made it the most, I don't know what I'm doing here, it certainly made it the most challenging uh, game to do a tutorial video for. First Martians was up there too, but that one was quite challenging. The Galarus would be another heavy game. I think Sekigahara, though, would be the, one of the most complex games that I've done recently that uh, was a challenge to create. But I, I mean, a happy challenge. I like sometimes those challenging videos. Ephraim Owen Maza asks, what game do you want to create a how-to-play video for, but is too complicated? Ooh. Which one is too complicated for me to want? What's my kryptonite? I'm looking at my shelves here, trying to think of an answer to that question. I mean, I don't, it's difficult because I don't think, given infinite amounts of time, I would enjoy tackling any uh, complicated game, maybe. I'm sure you could find some example. I'd say, no, never, I'd never do that. But then again, that would probably come down to the fact that that game just doesn't interest me. Because if I have an interest, a true interest in the game, then complexity becomes less of a barrier for me. But I'm looking at my shelves and I'm seeing Combat Commander, a game that I've only played once. It was taught to me by somebody else. And I loved the experience I had playing that game. And I want to play it again, but I'd have to teach myself the rules. And I have broken it a few times. And the rules have been just a little more than I could ever tackle in one sitting. And I would love to 
do a tutorial video for it just so I would have that I could go to to teach myself the game again. But it probably is on that a little too complicated side, honestly, to fit into my typical rotation of, of games. I have a game coming up in June, actually, that I'll be teaching. And it's not that it's an overly complex game, but the, the way in which it's going to, I'm going to be obligated to teach it is going to make the whole process a little bit more complicated, but I'm, I'm looking forward to it. All right, I'm going to try to do a better job of answering these questions faster. Don't think it means that your question isn't worthy of more time. It's just I'm, I'm running a little long here, and I don't want to go too much longer. For your sake and, and for, for anyone who might be watching later. Um, okay, Wolvie Zandaleri asks, how do you go about removing old games from your collection? Well, actually, I have an answer for this uh, because I've done this recently. Sell, give away, trash. I'm looking to thin out some games. I find I don't crack anymore. Uh, okay, so my main way is, I, so games that I don't uh, feel I want to hang on to anymore, I have a little area in, in the basement here that I stack them up, I put them in bins, and um, I will usually try to find someone locally I can sell them to. And I, someone recently reached out to me locally and said, hey, look, I know we don't know each other, but I know that you're into board games and uh, you have the channel, and uh, do you ever sell some of the games? Because you know, I'd be willing to swing by and pick some up. And I said, yeah, I actually have like four bins <laughs> full of games. Um, and they actually came and bought pretty much all of them. I tend to sell games at a very low cost, like five bucks a game. Maybe if it's a big game, 15 bucks for the game. I usually pr try to put some kind of price tag on it so people don't just take it because it's free and then they don't really care or value the game. If I don't feel like it's a game I can sell easily, I'll just give it away to Goodwill. And yes, on a few occasions I have trashed a game because I just felt like this is not a game I'd even want to give to Goodwill and, and curse somebody with. And um, I, you know, so I just, I just burnt it. Uh, not in anger, just <laughs> I had a fire going so I just tossed the cardboard in. Um, but normally, like the, the games that leave my collection, I don't, I don't like to publicize it because most of the time it is not an indictment on the game. And I know I'm a, a little bit of a public figure in the board game sphere or whatever. And uh, I, I would never want a publisher to see a game that I'm getting rid of and go, oh, he doesn't like our game. What, why, is, why does he not like our game? Um, I just have so much, only so much space. And I personally have only so many games I want to have in my collection. And I'm at the point now where I'm mostly giving away fantastic great games because I'm very selective about the games that I bring into my collection in the first place. I don't just get like endless solicitations of games. I generally filter what comes in into my home. So I'm doing a great job of keeping these answers short, aren't I? All right, Augusto Caroli writes, Are you excited for the next phases of Marvel? Heck yeah, I am. <laughs> I'm a big fan of Marvel movies. I'm a big fan of Marvel. Nothing against DC. But I do tend to prefer my Marvel characters to DC characters. And I thought the, the movies, by and large, have been fantastic. Yeah, there's been a few that I didn't, didn't care for as much as the others. But when, you, when I look at what I believe, the, such a crowning achievement to weave so many connected stories through all those separate movies with all those different actors and just... The, the difficulty it is in just creating a single movie to then create so many movies that have a through line and that call back to other movies, and then to have these incredible like Avengers movies that tied all of it together. I mean, what an accomplishment. So yeah, of course, I'm really excited to see the new movies coming. I'm very excited to see the new TV shows that are gonna be coming on Marvel with Disney+. Plus. They haven't shown as much, but the little hints of it, like WandaVision, oh my gosh, that looks incredible. I can't wait to see that, that show. So yeah, very, very excited. Uh, Nyland1 says, I'm really enjoying the expansion of your channel. Well, thank you so much, Nyland. Really nice to hear that. With this growth, what has been the most challenging part of making this transition seem so smooth to your viewers? Well, I don't know if it has been so smooth for all of my viewers, but for people like yourself and others, it sounds like it has been mostly smooth, and that does seem to be what the comments are suggesting, and that's really nice to see. I mean, one of the things I hope is that um, despite the fact that we decided, okay, we're going to launch with like, you know, four new shows uh, in one month, rather than just sort of dribble them out over time. And I kind of wanted to do that a little more quickly because I wanted people to know where we're going. And I, I wanted to kind of <laughs> have people be on board or not and give them the, the chance to quickly get out if they wanted to. They, sometimes they say in board game design, fail fast. You know, get your, your, get your ideas down quick, get them out there and, and, and uh, fail, and maybe figure out what's working or not working. Well, in this case, I had a benefit. Uh, Chaz and I are really good friends. We've known each other for a long time. And some of these shows he'd already been uh, producing. So I was, always very, I was already very confident in the quality of what he was creating. And um, it, was, it was the type of videos, 
top tens in particular are the types of videos I get asked for all the time. Ronnie, what's your top 10 favorite this or that? And, and it's not something that I've felt inclined to create those types of videos, but I do enjoy uh, top 10 videos myself. And I liked the format that he was creating because for me, at the very least, even when I watch these top 10s that are on our channel, I don't feel like I'm watching a top 10 that's saying, these are the top 10 best games in this particular category. Um, we're showing you 10 games that we think might be of interest to you. Ones that have stood out for one reason or another. And um, so therefore, kind of when I'm watching the top 10s, I, I saw, almost lose track of the rankings even a little bit. I'm just enjoying seeing 10 games that are of interest to me. And, uh, that, and then, by the way, that is not a knock against people who do like, hey, here's my top 10 favorite trick-taking games that you wear with a blindfold. I think that's awesome. I love seeing that and when, you, when you're hearing someone very passionately talk about their 10 favorite games. Um, but uh, this is a little different and I think it's a little more in tune or in, in, in the same tone as what M Watch It Play It is. And I, I also really appreciate that there's an element of, of humor and entertainment to them because uh, everything that I've done on Watch It Play of, la of Late has been very information focused, but at the beginning of the channel's life there was a lot more entertainment focus in there as well, or there was a balance of entertainment and information. So having some of that entertainment back and being able to collaborate with people that I respect and admire, like, like Chaz and like Matthew and like uh, Paula, has been uh, really good. And I hope that people kind of look, look at that emerging of our, of our work and go, well, that makes sense. Those guys have been friends for a long time. It makes sense that they would want to work together. And it is something we've been talking about for a long time. It didn't just happen overnight, even though it might seem that way. We've been talking for about a year and a half now about ways that we'd like to work together. Okay, I'm gonna, I, I, you know what, I, there's so many, I mean, I'm looking at this list. There are so many fantastic questions waiting for me here. I don't like to rush through the questions. I, I wanna give them their time. Um, How We Do It asks, I know your first playthrough was Mansions of Madness first edition, and this was the video that got me into gaming. What interested you or motivated you to make videos? Uh, this one I can try to answer quickly. Uh, because I have talked about this a little bit before on the channel, uh, so I'll summarize it. I, I was into board games. I, but I was having trouble finding a community around me to play games with. And I was listening to a lot of podcasts, I was watching videos, and I was like, you know what, I wanna, I wanna create something too. I, 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 have, I need to create something. I've always kinda had that in me. Uh, whether, before I was making Watch It Play It, I was making videos about other things. And I was creating websites, and I was make, you know, participating in e-zines, and you know, whatever. I always liked creating things. So uh, I felt like I wanna apply my, my creative desires towards this, this hobby I'm passionate about. And I realized that I wasn't going to be as ideal a person to do reviews. Um, and I said, what else could I do? Oh, I could teach games. I love teaching games. And there's some things that drew me to that conclusion that teaching games would be like a good fit, that people were looking for that. And, uh, but anyway, I, I started with teaching and playing uh, Mansions of Madness first edition, and I absolutely loved doing it. It was, it was so uh, incredibly fulfilling uh, to do, and I wanted to keep doing it. And I've been very fortunate to be able to keep doing it for a long time. And it's, be, it's been because of people like you who watch and take an interest in it and have seen value in it over the years, have financially supported the show. I find at some point in all these, I end up saying like, thank you to everybody all the time, but I can't help it. I get to do something I find incredibly uh, fulfilling. And I, I, I'm fortunate to be able to do that. And I, I didn't get to do that by accident. It wasn't like dumb luck. Um, I mean, there's certainly some dumb luck involved, but it was because people were supportive and, and that includes people like yourselves who are watching. So anytime I get an opportunity to thank people for that, I'm going to. You can't stop me. All right, Glowing Turtle. Have you ever played a print and play a game? If so, which ones have you enjoyed? Actually, somebody else asked that in the questions on the, on the guild and I didn't get around to that one. I have played a print and play game. If so, which ones and have you enjoyed? It's been so long. It's been so long since I've done a print and play game, I can't remember. But there are two print and play games that we featured in the um, Underdogs uh, top 10 list that we did this, this week. If you haven't seen the Underdogs episode, uh, can I encourage you to go check that one out? There are two um, games that are Super Marche and, oh gosh, I'm forgetting the name of the other one. It's a monster machine. You'll know it when you see it. And uh, both of them seemed really cool to me and I'm very, very tempted, very tempted to print both of them out and try them. Uh, again, June is gonna be an insane month, but I might keep it until July and then try it in July. But I really would like to try both of those games. Uh, also, uh, recently I did a tutorial video for Pandemic Hot Zone North America, and Z-Man Games actually has offered the entire game as a print and play. So you can print and play that game right now. And you can also learn how to play it by watching the tutorial video if you'd like. <laughs> so, so that's pretty cool, I thought. 
Oh, Jackie, I just got to your question, but you know, we're just a little late on time, Jackie. I think I'm going to have to end right here, uh, unfortunately. <laughs> so, Jackie, we started this live show by me not answering one of your questions. It seems fitting to end the live show by not answering one of your questions. I really do adore Jackie. I'm so sorry I'm doing this to you, but I have to end here. Jackie, will you come back again in a future live show and torment me with another question? And I will, I will do my best to answer you. We can make it the Jackie live show, and I'll try to answer all your questions. All right? But um, I think we're going to wrap up here at this point. Thanks again, everyone, for joining. Thank you for the super chats. Thank you for the support. We'll be back again in two weeks if all goes well, and I'll try to be on time next time. We probably won't have bags of milk or playing cards, but we'll have some other nonsense we can get up to. And I'll try to answer more of your fantastic questions. This was a really great night of great questions. And no, no phone calls from Chaz or Paula or Matthew or anyone. It's just, it was just us this time. Will it always be just us? Probably not. Probably not. <laughs> but, um, but until next time, everybody, until next time, let, let me just make sure I'm queued up here and ready to go. Until next time, thanks for watching. <laughs>